everybody, and thanks again for joining us here on Expanded Perspectives with me, Cam Hale. And as always, me amigo in here, just chin-chilling and talking archery, uh, the Fred Bear of Parker County, Cal Filson. How's it going, everybody? Yes, I'm here in Skeleton Studios on a brisk, cool uh, winter day, uh, having survived the ice storm of last Ooh. week. Yes, um, if you're not aware... Last week, uh, we didn't able to do an episode because we weren't able to make it to Skeleton Studios because yeah. of a severe ice and snowstorm that hit. These kids were out of school for five days. And let me tell you, when you're stuck at the house and you can't work and the kids are stuck at home with you, you start to get a little bit of cabin fever. It can be rough. Everybody's arguing about whose turn it is on the PlayStation, <laughs> what movie they're going to watch. You know, they want to rent all these movies that cost money. I'm like, y'all are going to have to decide mutually because we're not renting 30 movies this week. Right. You know what I mean? <laughs> so we did that. Me and Luke, uh, we watched a Critters Marathon. Nice. Uh, some of the episodes, I think there's like five, hold up. Uh, some of them are quite bad. But sometimes movies can be so bad that that's entertaining. And I yes. do not mind watching some movies that are so terrible. Like I told you the other day, I watched American Ninja 2. Mm -hmm. Terrible movie. Terrible. I can't, I can't believe that. When I was a teenager, I thought it was so cool. Well, but we got to realize the time, the right? Out of those ninja movies, and they're not the that 80s. great. Yeah. So I wasn't, yeah. But, you know, I was a, a big, I thought that kung fu was a real thing. I thought ninjutsu was well, a real thing. Well, it's a real thing. thing. It's a real thing, but not real good. Because when the UFC finally happened, and I saw a guy from Arlington, Texas, who was a ninjutsu black belt go against Pat Smith. And let me tell you. You want me, want me to tell you how I know <laughs> Is because you remember Pat Smith's name, but not the ninja's name. See, I don't remember. <laughs> exactly. That tells yeah. you right now how it went. It was bad. Well, ninjas are secretive. That's why I don't remember his name. I don't think it was revealed. He wasn't a real ninja because I could see him. Yeah, it didn't go well. No. And that's when you first were like, oh. You know, and I think this was for a lot of people because at that time, I didn't even know what jujitsu was. You're talking like 93? Yes. 92, somewhere around in there. And you'd have to rent the UFC video on VHS at Advantage Movie Rental. Maybe Blockbuster was out by then it in was our town. Advantage, I think, whenever we were. And, you know, Blockbuster started in Dallas. Like, I think that's where the original one was formed. Really? Yeah, and I still, I still think there's one left in Oregon somewhere. One old holdout, huh? I watched a documentary on Netflix like a year ago. Very, Those were good times being a kid to go in there back in the day. I try to explain it to my kids, and they just don't have any recollection. I still have my Blockbuster card. What's that old joke where, the, you know, the one that used to be on your keychain? Mm -hmm. And I remember reading a joke online where somebody said that they'd gone to buy beer and got carded when they took their keys out of their pocket <laughs> and they saw that Blockbuster tab. They were like, don't yeah, worry you're about good it. Enough. Yeah, good enough. Move along. Move along. Hey, Brad, I got something here to share with you. What is it? That I think you're going to like. Lon sent me this. All right. Lon's been hooking me up with all of this stuff. Here is another Glimmer Man observed in Chicago, this time reported by two different people. Yeah, we talked about it on the last episode when we were on with Lon about this current wave that's mm -hmm. going on in Chicago. And what does it mean and what is happening in and around that area that so many of these sightings are happening? Like, what what's drawing them there? It's so crazy. It's, it's, it's very gonna crazy. Get, we, we're going to jump back on there with Lon and them again, and, and hopefully we've got more crazy stories of that. But, yeah, it's odd. And right there around the airport, the whole thing. So get a load of this. It says a Chicago woman is at her father's apartment. She's on the balcony taking a break when she observes what she believes to be a glimmer man. Listen to this here. It says, I'm no storyteller, but I will try to recall as much detail as possible. Now, my experience happened on September 2nd of 2022, so not that long ago. I had been out through the day running a few errands here and there for my dad, who's elderly. So later that same day, to return back to my dad's apartments, which just happens to be in a tall residential building in Chicago... His apartment is six floors up. So at some point during the earlier evening, I decided to go out on the balcony for a quick smoke. So there we are again, Brad. More of the cigarette stuff, right? And there, again, somebody smoking sees something crazy. Says, I was standing there, just staring out into thin air, not really thinking about much or doing much. As I stood there with my cigarette in hand, I shifted position and began to observe a very large tree about 20 foot away. It was roughly about 15 feet down from me. I noticed that one of the branches on this tree was bowing quite heavily, which I remember now thinking back that was quite odd at the time. So as I'm staring at this branch and trying to make sense of what my eyes are seeing, I have this horrible feeling come over me. The most intense sense of dread and fear. It was like almost every part of my body was screaming at me, 
to turn around and run, and I didn't know why. At this very moment, that bowing branch that I had just been observing began to shake violently, and despite my internal instinct still screaming at me to leave, curiosity had now gotten the better of me, and I started to move along the railing to get a closer look. And that's when I saw it. What I saw at first was just a small glimmering form, but as I stared a bit closer, this glimmer then became what I can only describe as a transparent human figure that shimmered a yellowish white color. I snapped out of my fixated stare and quickly took a step back from the railing. It suddenly hit me what I was looking at was something straight from the movie Predator, more specifically when the Predator is using its camouflage. At that very moment when I realized what I had just seen, this thing dropped out of the tree and hit the ground below. It landed directly behind a man who just happened to be walking past at the time. The man immediately spun around assuming that someone had thrown something at him. The only thing I noticed was a cloud of smoke or dust arising from the ground behind the man. I waited for some time expecting to see this thing reemerge from the dust or smoke, but it was completely gone. Now, at the same time, another neighbor, just a few floors below, had also observed exactly the same thing as I, and they managed to confirm all the same details. The neighbor and I then managed to track down the man who was walking past a few hours later. We had a conversation with the man, and he said that he had felt an impact, but didn't see anything when he turned around. He also went on to report that he had felt the same dread that I experienced only hours before. Does anyone have any idea what these beings are? I feel like they can be dangerous, FL. Well, I will tell you that I've seen Predator 2. And in Predator 2, they were fighting and hunting the street gangs. You remember that, King Willie? Yes. Goes in, the, in the alley, and the guy's got the cane with the sword in it. And, you hear, and next thing you know, right. he's got King Willie's head. And the predator when the devil like, come call me. <laughs> yeah, killing the maybe. There's a lot of gang shootings in Chirac. Maybe the predator is down there hunting. Is, is down there challenging them, man. But it's not just there that no. they're seeing. But you're That's right, jokes, yeah, folks. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's what again? Like we've said before with Lon, with every, What could this possibly be? Now I will say this: more and more of these reports, they seem to be getting a little more brazen. We're seeming to get more to where they're in towns. People are seeing well, them in and around people. Now, I don't know, again, if it's because more people are looking and more people are paying attention. I want to read this note that Lon put with this. It says, I was eventually able to talk to both witnesses by phone. They both are very apprehensive about this entity. FL believes that the entity still inhabits the area that she occasionally experiences. Oh, I'm sorry. And that she occasionally experiences a feeling of dread when visiting her father. The location is in the Groveland Park neighborhood. Mm. So there y'all go. Well, like most of the sightings in and around Chicago are of flying humanoids, not of the Glimmer Man. This is only like the second story I've heard about the actual Glimmer Man. But speaking of strange stories, I got a strange one here that was sent to us. Check this out. It says, this story begins on a cool summer night in the city of Issaquah, or Issaquah, Washington, and the year was 1989. Now, at the time, I was a patrol sergeant on the night shift with a squad of four officers. The night had been uneventful until approximately 3 a.m. Myself and an officer I will identify as John responded to an alarm at a business located in an exclusive shopping area known as Gilman Village. It is made up of older homes and buildings that were moved into an area near Isaqua Creek, connected by a wooden walkway. Now, Gilman Village is a very popular shopping destination for tourists and locals alike. I, as a police officer, enjoyed walking through the complex while working night shifts, not just for the exercise, but to also do a little window shopping at many of the interesting stores. Now, receiving alarms at the different businesses throughout Gilman was common, and most of the time, they were uneventful. But on this particular night, there was nothing common or uneventful about it. John and I responded to the alarm at a business, which was then called the Levi Coat Factory. We performed an outer perimeter check of the building. We found it to be secure. 
dispatch made phone contact with the owner, who declined responding to allow us to check, or I'm sorry, allowed us to check the interior of the building. John and I returned to the parking lot, located on the northwest side of the complex. This is the area where we had parked our patrol units. John and I stood outside and carried on a conversation in the dimly lit parking lot, approximately 60 to 70 feet away from the buildings in that portion of the village. The buildings were to my left and to John's right. Both of us noticed an unusual movement near the eaves of one of the buildings. It was a ball of light, about the size of a cantaloupe, moving slowly from left to right, following the area just below the eaves. The light was very intense. We stared at the light until it disappeared around the south side of the building. Goosebumps prevailed. Officer John and I looked at each other, eyes wide open, and asked each other at the exact same time, Did you just see that? What we had seen was strange enough, but nothing compared to what we were about to witness. While we stood and talked about the strange event, our eyes once again were drawn to the northwest corner of the same building, only this time it was the lower corner. There was a perfect ball of very intense light, approximately a foot off the ground, and it floated around the corner. The ball was about four to six feet in diameter, and once again, it was a perfect sphere. The thing that made me speechless was what I had seen inside of the sphere. Walking upright was, for the lack of any other word, a creature walking. The arms swung back and forth, and the hands were turned with his fingers pointed to the rear. As the sphere progressed along the side of the building, it went behind some bushes that grew in between the sphere and the parking lot. The light was visible through the openings of the bush, and it was very clear that it was not being projected. As I recall, at least a full three minutes passed before either John or I could even speak. To put it lightly, we were terrorized by the unknown. Now, this event changed the way I think and look at stories by others claiming encounters with the unknown. John and I never spoke about it again until 2010. Thanks for all you do, Richard. So can you imagine two police officers respond to a call at night and they see a giant sphere with a creature inside of it walking, but it's in the sphere. Now, the only thing I will say is I wish it's like you would, a hamster ball. Yeah. I wish you would have gave a better description of this creature. Is it like a Bigfoot creature? Are you talking about like a gray alien looking creature? Are you talking about a dog man? He doesn't really give any details. So, Richard, please email the show back and let us know a, a description of the creature. He just mentions it's a creature. I mean, did it look like a, a rake, like a golem? Did it look like a gray? Yeah, true. What did it? What, what are we talking about? What was it? Yeah. I'm but curious. him and another guy saw it. I mean, and, and he says it changed the way. How could it not change the way you look at others reporting strange stories? You know what I mean? Like, since we started the show a decade ago, I've totally changed the way I see reports of stories. Like, in the beginning, I was very skeptical. But yeah. now, after time, I'm not saying I'm not skeptical. I'm just less skeptical. Because so many people are seeing these bizarre things. And I've met so many people. Yeah. Where you can, t yeah, I know what you're saying. I don't, man, I don't know. And what's so strange is just when you think, you know, like, OK, this is about as crazy as it can get, you know, wild stuff. And, and there's more wild things like I'm still fascinated by the idea that Bigfoot and UFOs are somehow there's a, a relationship somehow between it. I don't know. I don't know that there is or there isn't. I'm just fascinated by the way that some of these stories seem to have something involved in this whole deal. So let's take a quick break. When we come back, I'm going to jump into some stories about Victoria Peak, I think you're going to enjoy, folks. You're listening to Expanded Perspectives. And we are back, and uh, we're going to dig in to, like I said, a listener of ours named Jared had heard me talking about, uh, you know, that we're going to be heading off to Colorado and running around and looking around up there. And then, you know, talking about New Mexico and us running around up there as we were youngsters and whatnot. And he had brought up uh, the Victoria Peak treasure. 
And this is something that I had remembered hearing about. Now, it had been a while back. And it's one of those ones, like we talk about, you you heard a little something or you read a little something, and then it goes into the back of your mind, you know, and you don't think about it. And then a few key words kick up, this, that, and the other. But the, the fun thing is, is this story is long. There is a lot that goes into this. Uh, and it's it's something that dreams are made of, like... Uh, <laughs> Uh, Indiana Jones. It's like Indiana Jones adventure dreams is what this is made of. So it, it takes place in, on, you know, inside Victoria Peak there in southern New Mexico is where it all kicks off. So I'm going to get into the long and the short of it. Pretty much the long at the uh, at the first, I guess you could say. And then there's going to be more. But basically, what ended up happening was this. And we have to go all the way back to November of 1937. And a fella named Doc Noss, all right? Uh, Doc was an interesting character. And I, I don't even know if we should... Doc Noss? Doc. Oh, Doc. Doc was his name, yeah. And like I said, I don't even know if we should get into who he was, you know? I mean, there's a lot that goes into... Uh, he was a very interesting character. His name was Milton. All right, was his name. Uh, he was an American businessman. Uh, he went by Doc, but uh, his name was Milton Ernest Noss. And it's the whole story is almost, it's almost too much. It's one of those stories that it's just almost unbelievable. I'm just going to get into it. There's no way we can dig around it. I'm just going to tell you the story as the way this rolls. It, like I said, 1937, November. He called his wife Babe. Now, I think her name was Ova. Now, he and Ova and some friends of theirs were deer hunting in a place called uh, Humbrello Basin there in New Mexico. And they would always camp. And they've been in this area before, but they would camp on the in the desert down there on the little down below the mountains in there and at the bottom of Victoria Peak. And at the time this went down that day in November, so all the guys get up and they head off, you know, hunting. They go on their separate ways and all that stuff. And the wives, they stayed in camp. Now, this is, you're talking in the 30s. This is just the way things done. Everybody drives out the woods, puts up some canvas wall tents, and this is how they hang out and start going. So Doc's hunting by himself. So he's a, running around the bottom of the mountain, you know, and he's checking all this stuff out. And I'm assuming they're probably hunting for mule deer as they're running around there in New Mexico. And he says it began to rain on them. So, you know, Doc's like, man. I need to get out of this rain. So I'm sure he doesn't have some really outstanding rain gear back in the 30s. So he finds this rocky little overhang uh, up near the top of the mountain where he's up on top. I'm sure he's glassing or doing whatever he can to look around. And he wants to get in out of the rain. So he, you know, backs up under this little overhang and he's just sitting and he's going to wait for the rain to let up. Well, while he's waiting down there, he said he starts looking around and he sees this rock, a rather large stone. And in his words, he said it looked like it had been worked. So by worked, I'm assuming what he means is like it had been chiseled on or it had been ground upon or, you know, pressure flaked on almost like flint. But it was not flint, of course. But so he had done all this, but it looked like man had worked this. So he grabs this rock and he starts wiggling around trying to see if he can move it he's like you know because maybe you're onto something maybe you mm. find some cool artifact right yeah. so it's not moving so he, you know he sets and he takes digs his boot heels and he's kicking around it so he takes his boots he starts kicking his heels around there and he starts digging the dirt out around this rock till he can kind of get his fingers around it he's like i'm digging this thing up so he starts pulling boop he gets it to move well it's bigger than he thinks what's shown you know it's just the top of it so he has to keep digging keep digging keep digging digs around gets it up gets the rock off well as he moves the rock there's a hole underneath it, like a, a cave entrance. But, you know, it's not like a huge one. It's just, you know, about as big. Make a circle with your arms, folks, just like you're going to make a hoop, like you're going to hug somebody. It's a, it's a rock about this side moved out of the way, and there's this hole in the ground. Now, he goes on to say he's looking in it. It goes straight down, and from what he could tell, into the mountain. So he's looking down into this darkness, you know, and he's like, huh, what the heck's going on? So he gets down a little bit where he can see, and he says he can see that it looks like there's a wooden pole. And on this wooden pole, looks like it is tied to the side of this shaft that goes down into uh, the mountain. And the cool thing, too, is on that pole, he's like, you can see grooves cut into that pole, like for footholds. So it's like an old school style ladder. So instantly, being where they were at, Doc's like, oh, man, I found an old mine shaft. You know, somebody just abandoned it, so they just put this rock over it. It's nothing falls into it, right? Mm Mm-hmm. 
So he's like, all right, the rain stopped. He finished his hunting, and he goes back down to camp. And so he gets in there. He's going to have some coffee. His wife's got coffee made when he shows up. So he pulls her over to the side. He's like, sweetheart, come here for a second. And he tells her what he found. Well, she's like, hey, let's not tell everybody what we stumbled across. Let's let's have a little adventure. You know, let's not just everybody go running around up there. Wait for him to, you know, later on, and me and you'll come back. So, you know, she's like, that that's a good idea. And he's like, yeah, that's, you know, they get together. So that's what they do. So a few days go by. So they come back, right? They're like, okay, we're going to come back and check this out. So they come back. Well, they bring a bunch of ropes and flashlights. And, you know, they they actually, when they went back to town, they got a bunch of gear with them and loaded up on a bunch of gear, decided to come back. So, you know, they've got all the stuff that they need to do spelunking. So Doc, at first when he gets there, you know, he's got some rope tied off. He gets on that wooden pole, right, where he's got his feet on it. He's like, man, I'm not so sure this thing's going to hold me. Like this, I'm just, I don't feel so hot about this. So I think I'm just going to, you know, drop some rope in there and I'll just slide down the rope and I can climb back out. You know, so I'm picturing that with the knots every few feet, you know, he throws it down in there. So he kind of, you know, old school repels, climbs down this rope into this, this shaft. He had his flashlights and I'm picturing like he's got one of those, the old, with the, the lantern on his helmet, you know, where he's got some light where you can see. So he's got his hard hat strapped on with his light on it and all this stuff. So his wife, you know, she waits up top. She's like, I'll just, I'll hang out up here. So he starts sliding down this, this rope to get down in there. And he goes down, he, he estimates around 60 feet. And what he's hoping is near the bottom. And there's a rock, like a boulder stuck, almost blocking the entire shaft. But there's a hole over to one side of it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So he's like, huh? Now, later on in 1946, he actually was talking to a doc himself was talking to a field representative of the New Mexico state land office. All right. And the guy's name was Mr. Herkinoff, Gordon Herkinoff. And doc actually goes on in a report. And he was a, a four page report that was titled the field examination of NOS mining. All right. And this is mining claims. And Herkinoff actually wrote this down. And when I read this to you, this is what doc had said. It was, he said, uh, Dr. Noss claims that beyond the 186 foot depth, 186 feet, there's an incline downward at 45 degrees for 72 feet. Beyond that, there's supposed to be another incline upwards at about 30 degrees for some distance, around 40 feet, where an entrance is gained to a cave some 2,700 feet long, which contains many evidences that the cave was occupied as living quarters by a large group of humans for many years. That's what was written. So, And this is in northeastern New Mexico? Mm-hmm. Now listen, now that we go on into this. So Doc finally gets down to the bottom, right? He works his way around that rock, mm-hmm. okay? Gets yep. down to the bottom. And he said that it's a very small room. So he notices the minute he's down in there that there are not just drawings on the walls, but paintings something's painted all over these walls and some of them were even like it chiseled in like you ever took a rock or another stick as a kid on that just like old sandstone and you can scratch your name in the yeah, sandstone yeah. that's what he's describing is it looks like it's chiseled designs in the walls along with the paintings and these you know, charcoal drawings and all this and he said man it must have been made by the native americans in this area that's what this is this is going on so like i said he goes to the end of that chamber little you know it's not real big Goes to the end of that chamber, and it, there's another shaft that goes off of it. So I'm picturing a hallway. So he starts going down again. So he goes down. 125 feet, he goes down this little descended corridor, and then it levels off. And it levels off into what Doc said was just a giant natural void, like a cavern down there. And he said off of the walls of this cavern had been dug into and chiseled out smaller rooms. So you could tell it was used as like a gathering hall. So you've got the big open area, rooms off to the side. So he steps off in here, you know, now he's like, hmm. Now he claims, now this goes back, makes me start instantly, I start thinking about the uh, the Egyptians that were said to be in the Grand Canyon. Doc said he goes back and he said it kind of startles him because he sees a skeleton, right? Mm -hmm. And he goes, but the thing about it is this, this skeleton, what's left of it is slumped over a stake that's driven into the ground. So it's kind of piled up. You can see where this stake has been pounded into the ground and the bones, every, whatever's left of it, you can tell it's had its hands and every, it tied behind its back, its feet tied together. So whatever it was, this person had been left in here to die in the darkness by itself. Okay? Yeah, man. Now, it didn't take long. He said he starts shining the lights around. He starts finding more 
and more of these skeletons. And more that he finds are all staked out just like this. So the ones he's finding are tied off like this. So he goes a little bit further. He goes into these small rooms off to the side. And he said there's skeletons stacked in these small rooms, remains of people. And what he ended up reporting on that he had seen was 27, he counted, human skeletons in these little caves and all these little offshoots in this natural cavern area. So he goes on to start looking down these side caverns now, the ones that extend further in. Story goes that while he's in there, he starts finding old saddles, okay, Mm -hmm. coins, jewelry, some different artifacts, claims that he found a statue of the Virgin Mary made out of solid gold. He goes on to say that he also found some old letters that were dated up into the 1880s. Now, mind you, this is 1937. So he's found them from the 1880s. Now, that was only the start. The cave goes deeper. So Doc keeps going. Well, he goes in there and he sounds, he's like, man, I, you know, there's some iron. There's just iron bars laying around down here stacked up. He said there's about a thousand of them, several thousand of these bars. He said, now, I can't hardly move them. They weigh about 40 pounds or better. And they're stacked up against the wall. So he says, man, I could lift one. You know, but I don't know that I could carry it all the way back out. Now, we go back into this, folks. Later on, people have added this up, tried to add up what what Doc had found and all this stuff. They believe that the worth was a couple hundred, I'm sorry, a billion. Around two billion dollars worth of artifacts was in this cave. With with a B? With two L's. Billion. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Of like gold bars and stuff? Yeah, those aren't iron. That's gold. Okay, they don't know that shit. Now, he fills his pockets with these coins that he finds. He even goes on to say that he found a couple of swords down there that had jewels on them. So he can carry those real easy. Right. Yeah. So he gets up there and he, you know, comes back out, shows his wife. He's like, look what I have found. Here's these gold coins. Look at these old swords. She's going crazy. So he tells her all that he saw. So she's like, you need to go back in there and get one of those iron bars. He's like, oh, okay. So he goes down in there and he messes around a little bit, goes back in, goes in this narrow passageway, and he finds one that he can carry real easy. It's about half as big as this other one. So he gets up there and he pulls it in. He's like, well, this is one of these little baby ones that I'm going to bring out. You know, he's like, this this little one here. So he's like, I'm not going back in there right now. This is it. So she takes this bar and she kind of scratches it around because it's grimy, right? Mm-hmm. Scratches it around in the sand, starts rubbing on it, rubs it across some rocks. That's whenever you can see that it's gold. You can see the actual gold shining through all this. So at this point, she realizes, oh, this is a solid gold bar that we've just pulled out of here. So after that moment, they started coming back all the time. That they would come, they put a tent, they started basically living at the bottom of this mountain, and they would go up there and they explored every tunnel inside this place. All right? Yeah, I'm with you. And on each trip, Doc would come out with two bars. He would just come out. He would carry all the artifacts that he could, but the two bars of solid gold was about all he could carry out. It even goes on to say that at one time he brought out a crown that people, they claimed that there was over 243 diamonds in this thing, a blood ruby mounted in this thing. But Doc, (laughs) he wouldn't trust anybody, okay? What was you going to ask? So they have everything? I mean, they have rubies, diamonds, gold bars, swords. I mean. Yeah, yeah. Sounds too good to be true. Yeah. He would leave after he got all the stuff and brought it out and his wife saw it and all that stuff. At night, he would slip off and go bury it in the desert only where he knew it. He wouldn't even trust his wife. (laughs) Because, well, what is it? It's always the greed. The greed starts making people crazy. My precious. Yes. Now, he went on to report that he had actually found an artifact, or I'm I'm sorry, an artifact, a document. And he says that this document was dated all the way back to 1797 is what he claims and that it was buried now and he says he's buried this this document in a in a chest a wells fargo chest and that he had buried it out in the desert with a bunch of other stuff that he had hauled up out of there but he says that this document now i guess there's copies of it that got out maybe he wrote it down maybe this goes with the story i don't know how this all goes because as far as i know no one's ever found the original document nobody's ever found this chest But the story goes that this document from 1797 was written by Pope Pius III, all right? And it Uh was translated to say that seven, this is what it says that it says, seven is the holy number, and that there's a passage, and it says it continues on. 
that there's a lot of lines in this that this cryptic message to it, but that this document reads in seven languages, seven signs and languages in seven foreign nations. Look for the seven cities of gold. Seven miles north of El Paso del Norte in the seventh peak, Soldad. These cities have seven sealed doors, three sealed toward the rising of the soul sun, three sealed toward the setting of the soul sun, one deep within Casa del Cuevo de Oro at high noon. Receive health, wealth, and honor. Now that's what he claims that was written by Pope Pius III. Mm -hmm. So you start going, well, where, like you said, where did all this stuff come from? Well, at this point is where the Native American chief, Chief Victorio, shows up, okay? Yeah. Now, you follow the history of any of the Native Americans is in this area. This, this whole legend around Chief Victorio is woven deeply in this area. Uh, he was uh, the chief of the Warm Springs Apache war tribes right through there. And that entire area on that whole base and the whole thing was where he pretty much lived and his whole tribe stayed at. Because at when all this went down, he refused. They were supposed to take the Apache in that area, move them to the San Carlos Reservation, okay, mm -hmm. in Arizona. He had already had family and other parts of his tribe that had been moved there. Well, they had been starved out. They had moved the natives there, and then I'm assuming the Calvary or whatnot had starved them out and it just it wasn't a good spot that they had been moved to right yeah so he said look our people's lands are these mountains of new mexico i'm not leaving at all so he said i'm not you know you're gonna have to come get me you're gonna have to come on there in this whole thing but the federal government there in washington they promised that they could stay on the lands as long as what they said the mountains stand and the rivers flowed now get a load of this it says that the discovery of gold in those mountains back in 1878 is what broke the treaty from the federal government. So the story goes that the federal government finally pulled back and said, Hey, we'll tell you what, you don't have to go live where you want to live. Oh, there's, there's gold there. Now get out. Now it's ours again. And chief Victoria was like, no, now we're just going to fight. <laughs> so he went to war with them. Well, you got to imagine how it's not uh, a, a cavalry soldier, you know, uh, is not going to be doing so well battling a native in his home turf. So right. it's not going to work out so good for him. Also, too, he didn't care, right? He didn't care about gold. They said that, you know, they didn't care about gold. It was useless to them, but he knew that the white man cared for it. So the story goes that all through the Rio Grande Valley that him and his war tribe would attack immigrants, mail coaches, churches, wagon trains, pretty much anything that he knew he could get gold and money from, right? Yeah. He would even raid the stage lines all over New Mexico, even into Texas. And then, like I said, he was at war with the U.S. Army and the Texas Rangers at this whole time this is going on. It is also said that he would take prisoners and take them back to this, this basin, this basin that he you know was hired out in, and they said that he would put them in uh, a test of bravery. So it would be like a he would torture them, but it was a bravery test. And then, of course, he would kill them, which is what Doc even alluded to was the reason that they were score there were skeletons staked out in the bottom um, yeah. of this this cavern. So people were like, "Huh? Well, that might explain some of the the saddles or the Wells Fargo bags or some of the stuff that was found that Doc claimed that he had found there." Now, like I said, some of them believe, and some of the people that have researched it, and these treasure hunters believe that the Casa de Cuervo de Oro was what he had found, right? Mm -hmm. There's a, a, a there's another one that goes into this. When I say another one, there was another name that comes up. And this other name is the treasure of Don Juan de Onet. Back in 1958, he founded New Mexico as a Spanish colony. So they said that he was seeking out the seven cities of gold. And it is said that, that he was a very, like we've always heard that these... A lot of these uh, explorers were very cruel to the natives in this area. And they said that uh, any of the natives in this area, that if he would use them for whatever work he needed and then that he would torture them. If they didn't do as he said, he would beat them or kill them and do all kinds of this horrible things to the natives in this area. Story goes that he, going through these lands, uh, pretty much just took whatever he wanted anytime he could find it. If he could find silver, if he found any jewels, any gold, anything, that he had... 
a massive amount of this stuff and that finally word was sent to him in 1607 that he had to come back to Mexico City, right? Mm -hmm. And they believe, I guess, that maybe he had hidden it in this area. Some also think that it was uh, Mexico's emperor and the 18, uh, the, the fellow that served uh, the emperor there. It was apparently the emperor Maximilian and uh, in the 1860s. And they said that Maximilian had heard that there was going to be a plot to assassinate him there in Mexico. And the story says that, oh, well, maybe he packed up all this and had it sent out to, Mex to New Mexico to send it up into North America to get rid of all, hide all his goals. Like he was going to be able to make a run for it things like that. We don't know. There's a bunch of these, you know, stuff. And in, in, in fact, Maximilian ended up becoming assassinated in 1867. But there's a lot of really wild stories about, well, where did this money come from? Was it this explorer? Was it this? You know, this isn't just something somewhere in history. They would be a lineage to where this much money came from. The natives in this area, the Apache didn't just steal that much and hide it down there. It's just you're just not going to be able to do that. There wasn't that much coming and going and passing on the rail lines like that. So well, that's what where I was going to say is like, where the heck did all that treasure come yeah. from? Well, that's what they're getting into. Some even go on to believe that there was a Catholic missionary named Felipe Larue or Larue's. Uh, they believe that he because there was church documents that have his name that he was native to france and that he was actually a small in a small group of priests who volunteered to be sent into service in mexico so the story goes with him that they had sailed into florida that they come through the gulf of mexico to veracruz and all this and then they went you know to mexico city and they took all this stuff up and they called him padre right philippe there padre larue and that he went north and then as he was working his way up north that uh, he took a lot of the natives with him and all this stuff, and he actually had a large place that he worked at and uh, there in Chihuahua, there in 1798. And they said that there were some people from this area and all this stuff had heard stories about this rich source of minerals in the mountains to the north. So if he was interested in all that stuff, there's no writing about it, so nobody can really tell if it, the spur of gold and gold fever drove him in that direction. But the story says that uh, he continued teaching and ministering and all that stuff to this small group of people, and that among this group of people, that there was an old man who said that he had been an explorer and basically a soldier of fortune, a mercenary, if you will, that had lived his life in this whole area in North America. Now, he was in South America now, of course, and in Mexico and all, but he had lived up in this whole area, and that uh, LaRue actually took care of him, all right? Mm -hmm. So you got to imagine an old man laying there dying. And they become real good friends. LaRue, you know, just instantly bonded with him and his storytelling. And it's great. So the story goes with LaRue that one day he's like, hey, I keep hearing these stories about all of this wealth that's up in these mountains. Like, what do you if you've been all over? Right. What can you tell me about it? And the old man looked and he said, Padre, if you want gold. It's located high in the mountains, about two days north of El Paso del Norte, which, of course, is El Paso, Texas. He said, if you go there, he said, you get to El Paso. He said, it's one day after one day's travel from El Paso heading north. He said, you're going to see three small peaks further north. He said, when you first see these peaks, when you first lay eyes on them, he said, I want you to turn east and you're going to go across this little desert back in towards the mountains. He said, in these mountains, you're going to see a basin. And in this basin, he said, at the foot, there's a solitary peak that stands out there all alone. He said, if you go up on top of that peak, the top tip top of that mountain, he said, you're going to find gold. It's up there. So he had known these stories and these tales up until this point. So the Padre, of course, sets on this knowledge for a while. And yeah, why wouldn't he go himself? The old man? Yeah. He couldn't. I mean, he was, we're talking old, 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 old yeah. uh, laying there he dying. He when he was yeah. younger, man. So he tells this story. Well, finally, the old man passes away. And after he passes away, you know, LaRue is constantly thinking about this. Of course, like anybody would. You know, whatever he's willing about it would. So it goes on a little bit longer, a little bit longer. Well, the crops there, okay, in the, in the town he's working in, the crops start failing, things like that. It's, people are just, they're just not doing good in this area down there so he's like what am i going to do with my whole you know my, my parishioners what am i supposed to do with this group of people he knows that they need water he knows that they need food he knows that they need so he finally is like hey i need the giant gold virgin mary statue yeah. that's up there well he pretty much asked him he goes 
what if we go to a new place? Would y'all follow me if we go to a new place? So in the back of his mind, he's like, if they say, yeah, we're going, right? We're heading north is what we're going to do. So sure enough, he goes north and they're like, yeah, we'll go with you. They head up that whole deal. So they actually get into a village not far from Las Cruces. Okay. Yeah. And as they're going up to Las Cruces, he sees the peaks and he turns east and he goes through the little desert and he actually gets to the San Andreas Mountains. And then while he's there, he's looking around doing a little exploration and he sees the basin and he finds the natural spring at the base of this single solo mountain sticking up there. Now, the treasure hunters that follow this story and keep up with all this believe that the basin is Hembrillio Basin and that the peak is Soldad Peak, okay? Yeah. Now, like we said, you go through this whole thing. We've talked about Chief Victorio and the army and the battle up there. This whole thing. So LaRue puts out just a basic camp with all of his people. And while he's there, he sends some guys out to start looking around. He's like, yeah, just get up there and look around, see what you can find. Well, one of them comes back and he's like, hey, on one side over here, we actually found a vein of what we think is gold. So what do they find? Gold. They go up there. They start digging it. They actually work the mine. He gets his people up there. They work the mine. They dig, they dig, they go, they get, it's crazy. The deeper they go, they said the ore is just everywhere. Mm. So they get, he gets and, and basically sends word. They send up more monks. A lot of the natives come up there. They start working. This whole story goes that apparently he's found all this stuff, right? The whole thing. And that he got people from the local areas. I guess other, I'm assuming since it, it was the Spanish that it was Catholic, so he gets the other Catholic monks, the natives in this area, whatever he can do. He gets all the help. He may have even had some with him, but he gets all of them to start helping them and whatever supplies, and they start, from what you can read, melting the gold down and turning it into ingot, ingots is what they say, and that they find the natural cave. So while they're staying around this area, they're stacking gold in this thing. Well, the rest of the story says that... uh the church back in Mexico city gets word of this. I don't know if one of the monks finally gets fed up, you know, and goes back. It's like, I'm telling on them, right? Goes back. Well, they start going through, they go to the, the little Hacienda there in Chihuahua. Well, guess what? He's not there. The whole colony that LaRue, the Padre was over is missing. Well, of course they are. They're working in the gold mine, right? right yeah. That's where they're at. So the story goes that they send some people up there to start to try to find them. Like what's going on? Where did our Padre go? So they go up there. Well, the monks come back. He's like, hey, uh, that's true. The whole population of this town that, that the Padre LaRue was over is in the mountains working. It's documented in the churches. Yep, that's what we found. This is what's going on. So they uh, they send the you know some more people up. They're like, look, we've got to figure out what we, we got to get them out of there, basically. So another small group goes up there, this whole thing. Well, it's not really a small group. It's a Mexican army. He sends a group of his guys in the town to get some more, I say in the town, into some area to get some more supplies. And while they're in town, they hear the whispers of, oh, yeah, they've been coming and going through this town and staying here. They're coming to find y'all. They've come to look for you. There's been spies in this area. They know y'all are up there. Boom. So what happens? They run back up. They tell Padre LaRue that he's in serious trouble because he left the city. He left the town that he was supposed to be looking after everything for this whole, the whole deal, right? Mm -hmm. So they said, not only that, we want you to bring all that gold back because we're going to send it to Spain. Yeah. No, <laughs> no. He starts hiding everything. They, the story goes that not only he, but everybody under basically his view or uh, you, you could call it protection, I suppose. He worked them night and day to not only get all the gold finished and put up, but to hide everything. They hid every entrance. They hid everything that you could find out. Story goes, the soldiers finally get up there. They want to know where the gold is, and they want to know, you know, which was used. How would you buy all this stuff, the whole thing? Padre will not answer. Well, of course, following along the way it used to go that way, what do they do? They just decide, well, I'll tell you what. We'll just torture you. That's the way it's going to be. You know, you've, you've strayed from God. <laughs> Guess what you get to go through? The Inquisition. So they run him through all that. He dies. He died and almost all of his followers that were with him, the story says, died from torture because none of them would tell because they knew. Now, that's the story they go. None of them spoke. Yeah, right. That they knew that they didn't want to lose what they had. So the soldiers, they look everywhere. 
They finally return back to Mexico City with the, what they had had. They brought, I guess, they brought the body of the Padre back. The whole thing. They come back with this whole thing, right? Mm-hmm. Story goes, they show back up to the church. They're like, man, we don't have a thing for you. We can't. We tortured them. They're dead. We went everywhere. We've turned over every stone. I don't know where it is. We don't have any idea. That's what the soldiers are like. We don't know if the stories were true. I mean, we have to assume that everything we heard was true, but they never, they never shared anything with us. So from that point forward, you start digging around in the history books. It was called the Lost Padre Mine. Yeah. All right. Yeah, makes sense. So like I said, so now you jump from 1937. Now we're bounced back with Doc to 1939. So two years after he had found all this stuff, he decides, I need to make a bigger hole than that little hole I'm shinnying down in, okay? So he goes and gets a buddy of his. He's an engineer named S.C. Montgomery. And he's going to go up there with Montgomery up into there, and they're going to blast a hole. Oh, no. Yeah, they're going to blow the shaft out so they can get in there. So Montgomery goes to look and does some measurements, all this stuff. He's like, you know what? Eight sticks of dynamite. Eight sticks of dynamite will do exactly what we need to do. Well, Doc, no one better, of course, like, nah, 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 nah. It's too unstable. You can't use eight sticks of dynamite, man. I'm telling you, I've been down in there. Don't do it. It's too big of an explosion. Well, the engineer's like, no, you don't know what you're talking about. Eight sticks will be perfect. So they set the blast up, blowing eight sticks of dynamite up, collapsing the entire shaft. Uh, One stick of dynamite probably would have done it. Story goes, it collapsed, caved in everything, the whole deal. Doc at this time shut out of his own mind, basically. He's like, I can't get back in there, right? He tried. They said over and over he tried. They said they were tons and tons of rock and dirt filled this all this stuff up. They said at this point, Doc is furious. He's losing his mind because it was right in front of him. Now it's gone, okay? They say that it changed him completely. He, his marriage fell apart. He soon left his wife. In 1945, they were actually, you know, by law, divorced. But he had already abandoned her. He just got rid of everything. After that, two years after that, in fact, he marries another woman named Violet. Now, it got even worse because Doc had actually turned, I guess, this into a mine. He had actually filed paperwork and all this, right? Yeah. The story goes on to say that instead of having all of these thousands and thousands of of gold and all the stuff that he had that doc only had like a few hundred that he had hidden because i guess he didn't get them all out right so he goes well what am i gonna do so doc gets with another fella he's like you know that transported this all this stuff with him and said he's gonna start selling them on the black market story goes on that for about nine years doc tried to sell all this gold but he couldn't find anybody to buy it right nobody's gonna buy it so in 1948 doc meets a fella named charles ryan charles ryan just happens to be a texan Charles Ryan is doing a bunch of exploring out in West Texas, looking to do some drilling for oil. Well, Doc finds out about him. He goes to meet Ryan. They start chit-chatting. He goes, hey, you've got the ability to do all this big digging, right? And he's like, yeah, of course. He goes, well, I'll tell you what. I'll give you some gold bars for what it would cost. Do you think you could reopen that shaft? He's like, yeah, for $25,000. In 1948, $25,000. That's a lot of, yeah, it's a yeah. lot of cheddar. Yeah. He goes, uh, I'll do it. I'll do it if, if, if you can get me all that stuff. He's like, okay, we're going to, we're going for it. Well, uh, Ova, oh, the one he called Babe, his first wife, correct? Mm-hmm. She had already gone in there and it filed a counterclaim with the law office to deny entry, all right, by anything to, try to find who was the, I guess the, she wanted them to determine who was the legal owner of the mine. So when Ryan, of course, old Charles Ryan, he's going through all this. He hears about all this stuff that's going on, right? He's like, huh, what's happening? Well, at this point, Doc starts, you know, he's already frazzled, right? He's already unraveling if he was sane to start with. They said he feels like Ryan is fixing to double cross him. That Charles Ryan is going to wait and see if the wife gets, whoever gets owner, ownership so we have to assume that ryan that charles ryan was already kind of on the up and up knowing what was going on here Mm -hmm. so we have to also assume that oh okay all right what we're going to do is this so he thought he was going to uh double crossing he was going to wait to see who owned the mine whichever one got it either doc or his wife legally and then he was going to go to them and go i'll go ahead and open it up for x amount of this or however it's going to be so doc freaking out decides you know what i think i'll do i'm going to go dig up that gold that i was going to you know give old ryan i'm going to move it 
I'm going to move it somewhere where Charles doesn't know where it's at. So story, I guess, shows that he had actually shown Charles the gold and that Charles knew where some of this gold was. So he was afraid that Charles was going to go dig up the gold. Exactly. Flip on him, basically. That's the problem when you take on any partners when it comes to yeah. these deals is you got to always worry yeah. that they're not going to just whack you out and then take and, all the stuff. And take it and right. go. Yeah. So this is in March. This is March 5th of 49. So that night on the 4th, Doc had moved the gold because he just didn't have a good feeling, right? Mm-hmm. So Charles Ryan shows back up. He's like, what happened to the gold you were going to pay me? Where's this at? So they show up. They meet at the area where the gold was, but Doc moved it on him. Uh, right? So yeah. he's like, wait a minute. Where is it at? W- what's going on? So he's like, well, before we do any of this stuff, because I, I guess the way the whole story boils down is this. Either Ryan had the ability to dig it himself, you know, get the yeah. crew to come do it, or Ryan was going to take the gold and pay Doc cash, $25,000 cash for the gold. So Ryan could, I'm sorry, so Doc could in turn take that cash, basically laundering it because of the gold act. Remember the gold acts, all this stuff. You can't just go around selling gold, you know, no, back in right. the day. So I'm I'm guessing that there's two angles to this. Like I said, either Charles Ryan had the ability to, to have it dug. That's kind of one angle that it talks about. Or he had the cash because of what business he was in and he was going to pay Doc for the gold. You give me two bars of gold, I'll give you $25,000, then you can go hire it done from this point forward, correct? Yes. So, uh, Ryan shows up with the cash. Where's my gold? I'm going to buy that gold. I want it. You know, I'm. where's this all thing at? Nah, and Nas nah, is like, well, before I tell you where it's at, show me the cash. Where's all this stuff up? You know, I, I want to see all this. So, Ryan, at this point, is fed up. He's like, look, dude, you either tell me where the gold is or you're not going to be alive long enough to, to enjoy this money. Okay. Yeah. Story goes that after that, they, of course they get into it. You can't talk to me like that, you know, and all this stuff. So it's 25 grand in 1949 is a lot of money. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So they're going back and forth. So Noss is like, all right, all right. So he goes to walking towards his car. Well, Charles Ryan says he was afraid that doc was, uh, going to get a gun. So, uh, Charles pulls his pistol out. And shoots over there by Doc. He's like, okay, get on out of there. You know, no, 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 no. You're not going to go over there and get a gun and take my money away from me. So he tells him to leave, to get away from the car. Doc says, nah, nah, baby, I ain't doing it again. So Charles Ryan fires another shot, shoots Doc right in the face, hits him in the head, killing Doc Noss dead before he hit the ground. Wow. Yeah. 12 years after finding this whole thing, Doc Noss is laying there dead beside his car with $2.16 in his pocket. Now, they go to court. But no one, but Doc was the only one that knows where the gold was. He's the only one. And Ryan said he was afraid because he gets acquitted. He's charged with murder and later gets acquitted. Story goes because he was afraid that Doc was going to get a gun, turn around and kill him to take the money. Right, right. Because in Ryan's mind, there was no gold. Now, he may have showed it to him, but, I mean, we all know you could probably fake it if he wanted to. You know, who knows how this whole thing worked right, out. Right, right. It's two guys, but the only story, the only side of the story we're getting is the guy that was alive. And you ain't getting both sides of the story, right? That's true. But we do know something was going on because his ex-wife had filed that onto her. The good thing is this, though. They had made a claim. Her, his ex-wife, the one over our babe or whatnot, had made a claim with Doc when they first found all that at Victoria Peak, okay? Yeah. So she still had it. Remember, she had filed because she was fighting with him for who was the rightful owner. Well, she still had all that, all the paperwork, all the filings. So with Doc dead, it's hers. It's all 100% hers. Wow. So she's like, okay, I'm going to have some people clear this shaft. So she would randomly at times hire men to go out and move rock. Probably because it would cost a fortune to get in there and dig around. And you don't want a lot of people digging around in there because you don't want them to come back. How are you going to guard it if you're you know, an older yeah. woman? How are you going to guard that's this That's what I was thing? saying earlier. Is you you got to be careful sharing the information. You don't want to crew 200 people there because that's 200 people yeah. that now know that there's a huge treasure there. Uh, exactly. It gets even wackier than that, though. The government gets involved in this whole thing. When the I government? Say, in 1955, the White Sands Missile Range decides to expand, okay? Oh, yeah. They and did. as they expand, they take in. Umbrilio Basin. So and it's like eminent domain. Oh yeah, there's nothing you can. They don't care. They don't ask you if you want to sell. They tell you you're selling it. Now, 
here's the worst part of that. So they take in that whole area, all right? She has the claim on this whole area, on this land, this whole deal. She starts filing requests. She's like, dude, that's my land. I've got to get in there. I've got to work and get all this stuff out. They just ignore it. They're like, no, I don't think so. She would go in there to start clearing it out and send people in there. The military would escort them armed off the property. No, I don't think so. From 1955, that's when it all started in, in courts, in the legal system of ownership on who owns this land. The military claim said, you know, and, and there was even a, a statement made by the New Mexico officials in that area in 1951. They're talking about that, that they had reserved this land for military use only. OK, and because of that, that it had withdrawn any prospecting ability. You couldn't have entry. You couldn't have any location. You couldn't even purchase under any of the mining laws. It did not matter. It didn't. They didn't care. OK. Yeah. Now, the Mexico officials said that they had leased only the surface of the land to the military. So there was two sides of this whole thing. Military owns all that. And an old babe, Doc's, uh, Doc's ex-wife, was like, no, 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 no. You may have the top. I got what's inside that mountain. That's what's inside. It's mine. Right. So it goes to this whole thing. Well, they couldn't, like I said, it, still, it would get more and more complicated. They would search all of these. This is the worst part. They searched all the mining records, okay, in air quotes. So they couldn't turn up anything that had that of Doc Noss's name on it. Well, yeah, because it's the U.S. government. They don't have to turn over. Oh, yeah. Oh, we don't see that and just throw it in the trash. You know what I mean? Right. So they're like, no, no. The Actually, too, where the land of Victoria Peak is located is not owned by the state of New Mexico, but by a fellow named Roy Henderson. And Roy Henderson, that wasn't New Mexican land. That was private land. And he leased all of it to the U.S. Army. So Doc didn't even do his homework to find all that out if this story is all true. So. They finally worked it all out in federal court. There was a compromise, and it stated this, that the Army would continue to use the surface of the land, but no one would be allowed on the property without the Army's consent. So, no one could ever mine the treasure, and the story goes that that meant nobody in the, the Army couldn't get to it, and neither could she. That was the story. Now, the military refused any of her efforts at all to come in there and work, okay? So they got top secret stuff yeah. going on. They don't care about you chasing some no. lost gold. But here's the greatest thing. Said the Army couldn't work it, not other military personnel. They could come in there and do exploration of Victoria Peak. There were two airmen from Holloman Air Force Base would go on record and later say that they had found the gold cavern from another natural opening on the other side of the mountain, the other side of the peak. The military did. Yeah. There was a fella that was an airman first class named Thomas Burlett and a Captain Leonard Fague. And they said that they had found approximately 100 gold bars weighing between 40 and 80 pounds each in a small cavern. And that after the discovery, Captain Fague went on to tell people that uh, he had caved in the roof and the walls to make it look as if the tunnel had ended. Now, neither of these men had any idea about the laws to talking about the discovery of this whole thing. Right. So Fig goes in to the, the advocate, this judge advocate's office there at the Air Force Base, and he's talking to a fellow named Colonel Gaswitz. Okay? Yeah. Now there's two involved, okay? The airmen and the army are now involved. So Burlett and Fig, they what do they do? All right, well, let's go form a corporation. Let's go form a corporation real quick. We're going to just basically cover our butts on what we found, okay? And... They made a formal application to enter White Sands to search and retrieval of this gold. But White Sands forbid it. They canceled it. So the airmen like, no, 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 no. We've already gone through all this, boys, and we just shut it down. You can't be over this because you were up there running around doing your thing and found it. It's not yours to find. Let me guess, though. They kept it. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So in the summers of 1961, in that summer, it was a fellow, the director of the Mint, Major General John Schinkel, there at White Sands. He, this would give him the advice, he allowed Captain Feig, a Captain Swanner, and Major Kelly, and a Colonel Gorman, those men, to work the claim. He's like, yep, we'll, we'll let you work this. So on August 5th, you know, like we said, Mr. Feig there, him and his buddies go back, and that they are actually accompanied at this time by a command, the commander of the missile range, 14 MPs and a Secret Service agent is the way the story is told. And they said that Captain Feig was unable to get that opening that he had caused the collapse in three years ago. So it's three years have gone by since he's been allowed on there. 
He can't get back in. He can't penetrate back into that mountain. They can't uncover it. So General Schinkel, the man that allowed them to go on there, said, all right, that's it. Get out of here. You're done. I give you a chance. You couldn't prove me anything other than just, I guess what most of them thought was that they really wasn't anything in there. They were just going to look for it. They hadn't found anything. Well, they can't anything. have people snooping around their secret base Even under if you're the military. pretense of saying we're looking for gold. So they're like, exactly. the only way to get these bozos to go away is to let them look. Let them so look. I'll give you a couple of weeks to look. If you don't find nothing, you're out of here. Yeah. Sorry, we, we gave you a shot. Yeah. Makes Later sense. on, Commander F- or, oh, Feig, Captain Feig, even took a lie detector test so it would allow him back on the base, okay? Yeah. So they were like, is this really what you're looking for? They want to put this hole through there. Story goes, at this time, in this exact spot where he had found all this and the commander had seen it and said, we're done with it and all this stuff, that there was a full-scale mining operation going on there on the side of that mountain the military were doing. Now, the well, old, that, the that old gal. That sense, right? Yeah, 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 right. So the wife, oh, babe, she babe. had heard, yeah, she had heard that the military is working the claim that she said that she had had, which we know now didn't exist. Yeah, it was some other guy's land. It was another guy's land. They never, they never found anything with the claim, this whole deal. So she hires some guys to uh, sneaky, sneaky onto the military base, right? Yeah, that's not smart. No. They get caught. They get caught trespassing, of course, while they get up there on the mountain. They get escorted off at gunpoint, carried away. They come back to her. They're like, uh, not only are there armed men in fatigues, like in military camo, armed on this mountain multiple but there are men working on the on, there is a mining group going on on the side of this mountain there was even an affidavit signed october 28th of 1961 claiming uh, that they had seen a military jeep and a weapons carrier on the mountain okay i'm with you they even said that she talking about babe uh, started reporting on this whole thing that she reached out to a fellow named Oscar Jordan with the New Mexico State Land Office, and he starts going back through the Judd Advocate's office there at White Sands, right? Yeah. So he's like, "What? what is going on? You know, you said that nobody could be on there, and that we've settled all this. You're not going to let her on it. Now the military is mining it. You know, they've already said all this. So like we said, so General Schinkel has to look into this, well, uh, apparently General Schenkel didn't even know that they were mining it, air quotes, didn't know. Right, yeah. So he stopped everybody. Well, in 1963, there's another mining company called Gaddis Mining Company out of Denver. And they had a contract with the Denver Mint and the Museum of New Mexico. And they obtained permission to go in there to the site. And for three months in 1963, so starting at June 20th, they went all through there. And they used all of these mining techniques to find all this stuff and even aerial photos looking at this whole thing story goes that they didn't find anything at this whole place they didn't find nothing they're like ah, well, well of course we didn't you see would, anything of course you would say that though yeah. even if you did find something because once you admit that you found something then you're gonna have people filing lawsuits trying to get their property back and if you're like no we looked we looked really good i didn't see nothing i didn't there. see nothing uh, in 1960 or 1972, F. Lee Bailey gets involved in this whole thing. He gets drawn in. He's representing like over 50 clients. Babe Noss, you know, Doc's ex-wife being one of them. All of these treasure hunters. A whole, I mean, the Feigs, him and his buddies, you know, they've built their their little business. He's representing them. So what they do is they compromise they're with the military, all right? So they're like, well, what? we're going to have to let these people in. You guys can't hoard this all to yourself. When this, this started 20 years before y'all took it over, this has been going on. So they led a group, okay, called Expeditions Unlimited. Now, that's a Florida treasure hunting group. They, rep- they let Ep- Expeditions Unlimited represent all of them. And they said, okay, we're going to compromise. They're going to let Expeditions Unlimited come in here, and we're going to let them excavate the peak where all this is allegedly taking place. So in 1977, they're going to come in. The Army steps in and goes, well, we'll let you come in, but you get two weeks. That's it. That's all you get. Well, in two weeks, they couldn't hardly get the ball rolling, you know, because you've got a lot of work to try to make up in two weeks. So two weeks goes by. They didn't find anything in two weeks. The Army 
gunpoint, get out of here, go on. At that point, the Army shuts down all operations, and they said that there are no additional searches allowed ever on this whole thing. You're never, that's it, it's over, you're not going to be allowed to, to look in here again. Doc's wife, Babe, dies in 1979, never knowing what happened. Nothing at all. Well, her grandson, Terry Delonis, goes on and forms the Ovanos Family Partnership. Okay? So, doing to that, he starts telling these stories. He's trying to get the world, like what I'm sharing with y'all, to know about this, to get people going on. Well, uh, you know, like we said, you go on, you go on. Th- th- all these stories start popping up. So they start going, well, what are we going to do? How are we going to to know if it's a, a real thing? So the, there was a story, but the man, like I said, Captain Swanner, he was stationed at White Sands, okay, in, in the 1960s. And he comes forward and he starts telling the surviving Nos family and all this stuff what he had seen. And he was actually at the time in 1961, the chief of security. And he said that he was sent to inspect the report made by Burlett and Captain Feig back when it all went down. So he comes forward after all this time. He's like, I had to go check it all out. He said, I determined at the time that the report was accurate. So the entire place at this time was made off limits to the military. You know, he's like, wait, what those guys just told us is true. Lock it down. We're going to go check on it. They go this whole thing. Well, reportedly or allegedly, let's say in air quotes, that the military actually gained entrance, gained access to one of those caves and found everything that was in there. And the story goes from this fella that the gold was taken and sent to Fort Knox. Now, the military did confirm that Swanner had served at White Sands during this time. But they go on to say, oh, no, there was never any documents or anything about that claim. He never went and investigated any of that stuff about the removal of gold bars or all that. Like, no, no, that's just a joke. So as far as we know now, the military doesn't, they don't even acknowledge the whereabouts of the gold. Nobody even know, you know, this they don't acknowledge thing. that they even found anything. No, 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 no. M- most of the entire Nos family that that was involved in this docs and, and you know, his ex-wives and all this stuff, they all believe that the military got involved when they expanded. Like, like they just stumbled upon it. Some believe that the military knew and found out about this over these years and then they expanded it to stop it so they could have it. Right. Others, you know, who really knows? Now, like I told you about her grandson, Terry. Her grandson, Terry, has actually been quoted saying this, that we are not accusing the military of stealing the gold, but I do feel that the Department of the Army in the 1960s treated my grandmother unfairly. However, we've worked very hard over the years to establish a working relationship with the military, and we're certainly not going to jeopardize that by accusing them of theft. So, he won't come right out and say you did it. A lot of the other family will. So they've come out and like, we know you did it, this whole thing. They don't. There's never been... Look, there's there's photo... You know, I say photographs. There's photographs of aerial shots of this area. Some people point to certain things, say this is it, that is it. We don't really know. It's like, I've not seen anybody come forward and had stuff set and said, look, these are the old saddles. This is the gold bars. These are the old Wells Fargo. This is the old paperwork. You know, you always hear the whispers, like, we've seen this, or I've seen that. I was going to say, did Mr. Noss, did he ever produce these swords or anything, or has he just claimed that he took a couple gold bars? Well, no, the, the, the workaround on that whole thing is this. They said that if it wasn't real, then why, after he's dead, did his ex-wife continue the battle to get in there? She didn't know where he moved it. Remember, she he abandoned right, her he and moved went it. and hit he it. He showed it to her, but and then she when she went to sleep, he hit it. She helped him pack it out. She spent two years of her life. So she life saw it. She in, f- physically saw it. She physically saw every bit of it. They're like, it would be one thing if it was an old man that was just claiming all this stuff. Yeah, yeah. But his ex-wife said, "I, have, why would you continue the fight? So people now believe that even as crazy and outlandish as this story is, that they're like, no, there's a lot of truth to this story, that something was found in that cave that was gold. We don't know where it come from. We don't know this cache of, there's no telling how it got there. Rubies it may have and been, diamonds and swords. And it may have been a little bit of all those stories. The stories I told you about the Padre, the stories I told you about the Explorers, the stories we discussed yeah. about the Native Americans. It may have been one may have stumbled upon the other, and then the other one stumbled upon that and was like, 
then how this cave is mine. It may have worked its way up to the, where the Native Americans were like, this cave is, this is where we're going to keep everything. And then as, as time went on, it's kind of in the passing has gone by. There's a lot more to this story of, of the twists and turns and how people were stabbing each other in the back and trying to, to try to get this all on their own. But it's crazy. The story that the idea that this could actually be in the New Mexican desert, of course, it's not there anymore, but that this may not be the only one that the, the tales of of lost treasure as grandiose and as crazy as it sounds may truly be for real. That all, all these stories that we hear may have a lot of truth to it. Mm, pretty wild, right? It is. I'm glad y'all uh, hopefully enjoyed it. I enjoyed talking about it. It's one of my favorite old school stories. Let's take a quick break. We'll come back. We'll wrap this dumpling up. You're listening to Expanded Perspectives. back hope you enjoyed a little run back just so we could have a little fun with it uh it's still more of the craziness it of makes, hidden treasure yep. and it's right there and something about it feels like I, with all the stuff that's been released over the last few years that it seems like the government is kept hidden and they finally let go or let it out i hope that more of this story comes out i hope we find out that all this stuff was actually true like every bit of it well i like also you know it shows you how corrupt the government was even back in the day like they gave them land to the indians and then they realized that there was gold there and they're like no we were just joking we yeah, want it back just funning and, yeah and i like the idea because you know other people say that this whole thing is a hoax I like the, it's the kid in me, right? That remembers Indiana Jones. That's that it. Every time the caves and the caverns and the secret treasures, and you just hope that that stuff's there because it's so cool. And, and you know, and also where it takes place, like New Mexico is a very desolate state. Yes, I've driven through a lot of states, and every time I drive through there, I'm always like, man, can you imagine what's hidden in these hills? All the what stuff that we may never find, there, right? right? Yes. Whether it's the crazy alien base at Dulce, New Mexico, or or the secret caves, and, you know. Uh, it's. I'm with you, though. But the whole thing is, it's the Indiana Jones vibe from being a kid. I want this stuff to be bad or be, a, be real. Just like that, I want to believe, right? Like, I want this to be a real thing. Yeah. And, you I know, like the mystery in the world still. I still like the story of the ones that the secret caves in, in the... I can't think. The Grand Canyon. The Grand, yeah, the Egyptian caves. Yeah, right. Yes. It, it makes you wonder because you see all these different artifacts that showed up. You know, they're not supposed to be here, yet they find Egyptian artifacts here in North America. Perhaps there is a treasure somewhere. Do buried you think, somewhere, you know, where they traded it with the Native Americans at the time. The Native Americans didn't know what it was. And it's just been lost to time. You know, like there's lots of rules where if you find like an arrowhead, you're supposed to not pick it up. You're supposed yes. to leave it where you find it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. And so I, I just wonder now that the more and more stuff, I hope one day that we uncover that that this stuff was all real. Like we find out just how much travel and how many things like we've discussed in the past with and like what Graham's brought up and Randall's brought up. And more and more people are getting on board with the idea that we've been reset numerous times due to Mother Nature. Right, Like there's been big cataclysms that have rocked human history. And I hope that we find out more about the fact that maybe the Egyptians were here and, and that we have now irrefutable proof in all this where people can argue where you find out that this whole place was like that. There was things in Egypt and there was, you know, lost other tribes and groups here and all that way, way before. Well, it seems like people's minds and ideas on the past all, is changing. Yes. To me, I've noticed it just in the last decade. 
that it seems like people are willing to, I don't know if it's the popularity of guys like Graham Hancock, Randall Carlson, uh, and, and it's got to help. John and, like, West, and Joe and having them on. Yeah. It's bringing yeah. them to light because I've noticed Randall's gotten way bigger. I mean, we were lucky yeah. enough to speak with him. You can go back and listen to our interview with Randall. And back then he wasn't really doing any interviews. He did the, a couple with Joe, but that's just because Graham brought him along. But in the Gramerica boys, he was on oh, yeah, with him yeah. quite a bit. Yeah, that's right. But we were lucky enough to get him. I don't know that we could even get him now. You'd have to re- yeah, probably right. have to go through a handler or something. But probably so. I think people are starting to look at this stuff. And you don't have to be formally trained. Like when you look at the watermarks on the ground yeah. from the sky, you're like, yeah, it's obvious. I'm not a geologist, but you can see it. It makes sense. And now I've got this crazy stuff where we're looking into the whole thing of Atlantis that old boy was talking about. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right. So now you're like, oh, I've been reading and looking into all that. So, yeah, it's it never ends. The madness never ends. I like the stories yes. of the lost treasure. If you have any stories you'd like to share with me and Cam, the listeners, please do not hesitate. Email the show, expandedperspectives at yahoo.com, or you can call the show, 888-393-2783. That's 888-393-BRUD. Uh, don't forget about our sponsor, Lumi Labs. Microdose is available nationwide. Woo-hoo! To learn more about microdosing THC, just do a quick search online or go to microdose. Dose.com and use the promo code EXPANDED, that's E-X-P-A-N-D-E-D, to get free shipping and 30% off your first order. Cam, what do you got planned for your weekend? Dental surgery, baby. That's right. I forgot about that. You're going under the knife. Yeah. Finally get to get this problem taken care of because I'm like, I'm pushed to the limit. Dude, I'm dying right now. All right. It's not been pleasant, but here we go. So yeah, that's my plans. Recovery. Recovery and I guess like mashed potatoes. I don't. I have no idea. Right <laughs> yeah. here we go. Lots of soft foods in your future, <laughs> right? Yeah, probably not. But we'll see. I've got to make sure I don't get the old dry socket. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Got to be careful of that. So yeah, that's pretty much my plans. What about you? I'm going to be catching up on work because I wasn't able to work for five days because of the ice and snowstorm. So yeah. But I'm glad to be out of the house. I'll tell you that. <laughs> I hope everybody out there has a good a good one. Be safe. Till next time, folks. That's all the time we have for this episode. I'm Kyle. He's Cam. Peace, y'all.